So I want to pretend that we're not at your typical TEDx venue. Let's pretend we're in a barn. <laughs> there isn't carpet on the floor, there isn't tile, there's wood chips. Some of you are sitting in a covered wagon, some of you are sitting on wooden benches. And I want you to think about where we are as I discuss with you three things. We're going to talk about problems in life and how we have approach them. We're going to talk about authentic learning and we're going to talk about love. 23 years ago, I moved to Honduras. I had never left the Western United States. And as a 19-year-old, I stepped off the plane and I was smacked in the face with everything new. I had never seen the heat or felt heat that I felt. I never felt the humidity that I felt stepping off that plane. And it took me probably six months before beans and rice tasted good. Other than those things, the thing that struck me the most was the extreme poverty that I saw. Never before had I seen the extreme poverty that I experienced in Honduras. Never before had I seen the extreme suffering. But never before had I seen the happiness that I found in Honduras. And this broke my heart, but it opened my heart, and it opened my mind, and for the first time in my life, I was teachable, truly teachable. Fast forward about a year, I was walking down a dusty street. It was hot, middle of the summer, so hot, so dusty that if you pounded your foot, the dust would come up to your head. And as I was walking down the street, I saw on the corner of two roads a little brick home, two-bedroom home. The walls were falling in, the ceiling tiles were falling down, or the adobe tiles, and there were plants growing all over this roof. And I remember looking at that house and thinking, whoever lives in that house needs my help. So I walked over to the door and I knocked on the door. The door was so rough that I remember it hurting my knuckles. As I knocked on the door and waited, I heard a little voice inside say, I'm coming. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and finally the door opened. And opening the door, I saw a little old man. He had a gray beard and he had gray hair. And he leaned out of his wheelchair to open the door for us. His body had been completely destroyed by the effects of polio. I don't remember him inviting me in, but as my eyes adjusted, I saw on the side of the building a full-size helicopter. I pushed past Augustine, and I walked over to this helicopter, and I said, what is this? And the old man, Augustine, said, that's my helicopter, with pride in his eyes. I realized pretty quick after meeting Augustine that he did not need my help, but I desperately needed his. I would go there every day that I could. And Augustine slowly taught me his life philosophy. He taught me how he had become who he was. One day as I was sitting with him, Augustine, with pride in his eyes, looked at the helicopter and he said, at 15 I learned that I could pick my problems. I had polio and I didn't want that to be my defining problem in life, he said, so I picked this helicopter. And every day until 2017 when he passed away, he worked on that helicopter. I was blown away. I had never thought about this, this concept that I could pick my problems. I came home shortly after meeting Augustine, and I got involved in my life. I got married. I started having kids. But this idea that Augustine had presented bounced in my heart and bounced in my head, and I couldn't get it out. With a group of friends in 2007, we decided to fly to Honduras and tell Augustine's story. So we created a short film called Everything is Incredible. I decided, that I'm like, let's put it out online, let's see what happens. Emails started coming in, telling me what Augustine's story had done for, them, for these different people from all over the world. To this day, that film has been viewed for over 400,000 times. And I was lucky to get these emails come in, telling me all these stories. And I started thinking, what is Augustine's story going to do for me? How am I going to change my life? How am I going to pick my problems? So I quit my job, and I started teaching high school. I don't know why. Uh, just kidding, I loved it. So I started teaching character education, and it was amazing. I was seeing these changes in my students that were blowing my mind, and I felt myself changing as well as we tackled these really difficult topics like empathy, like kindness, like anger management. But after two years of doing this, I started to question, is this my defining problem? Is this the problem I want to have define my life? I started questioning whether teaching character from a whiteboard was really the best way to do it. As I was in this mode, I was with some educators and they started throwing out ideas and we were discussing problems with education. They would throw out an idea and I'd shoot it down. They'd throw out another idea and I'd shoot it down. And finally, one of them was frustrated with me and they said, okay, smarty pants, what do you think needs to happen with education? And I said, 
I think kids need to experience three things. I think they need to watch something be born. I think they need to watch something die. And I think they need to grow something that they will eat. A farm. I called this, and I started coming up with this concept um, of a farm-based high school. I wanted something authentic. And I rallied around, and I got some other crazy educators. And in 2015, we started Roots Charter High School. I remember the first day of school, I looked out on the crowd, and I realized something very quick. I did not know how to run a school, and I did not know how to run a farm. <laughs> we were targeting at-risk kids, and I didn't know as well what that really meant. And as I looked out over these kids, this group of kids that had come this first day of school, I started to see in their eyes that they were going through real things that I had never experienced, real problems. I read about a study called the ACEs study. A stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. This study gives kids and gives different people a questionnaire of 10 things. And these are really difficult questions. Like prior to 18, were you ever raped or molested? Prior to 18, did you ever suffer hunger? Prior to 18, did you ever have a family member incarcerated? The students that came to my school, to Roots, were scoring on this questionnaire between a 4 and an 8 out of 10. This study also says that a kid who scores anything between a 5 and up is going to have a very difficult life, full of health problems, full of addiction, and full of these different things. And I was seeing it. One day, a especially difficult kid, uh, I think he told the teacher to F off or something, and he got sent to me because I was the principal. The problem was I wasn't interested in this kid right now. In front of me, I had a burrito, and that was what I wanted to focus on. I was hungry, I was tired, and this was my time. But he walks in, and he sits across from me, and I start pulling these concepts out of all of my reading, how to be a good principal. And I start talking to him about his behavior, about consequences, about what he did and why it was wrong. And all he's doing is he's staring at my burrito. So I look at the kid. Finally, I get wisdom. So I look at the kid, and I said, are you hungry? And with tears in his eyes, he says, I'm so hungry. I said, when's the last time you ate? He said, yesterday. So I pulled out a knife. I'm probably the only principal that carries a knife, but I do. Pull out a knife, and I cut the burrito in half, and I handed him half, and we sat there and we ate. We didn't talk about his behavior. We didn't talk about what he'd done. We shared a burrito. And from that moment on, I decided that I needed to reevaluate re what was my defining problem with this farm-based high school. And we decided that it was, we need to meet some of these kids' needs. We need to give them food. So we opened a pantry. The pantry we filled with volunteers, brought in non-perishables. We filled it with meat from the farm, vegetables from the farm. And any kid who needed it could walk into that pantry and take whatever he wanted. We also changed our lunch program. We created a non-funded, so through private donations, we created a program that any kid that wanted lunch could get in line and get a free meal. And it made a huge difference. This defining problem completely transformed the lives of the kids that we were teaching. But it wasn't my defining problem, and I realized that pretty quick. One day I'm sitting with a student. This student was having a terrible time in his life, and I start going through, I love to read self-help books. It drives my wife nuts. I'm going through with this student. I'm saying, let's make a one-year plan. Let's make a two-year plan. Let's make a five-year plan. And I look, and he's glazed over. He's not even listening to me anymore. And I looked at him, and I said, I'm going to ask you a really difficult question, and I need you to answer it. This kid was a 16-year-old, and I said, is your future bright, or is it dark? And he put his head down, and I heard a faint, it's so dark. This became my defining problem. How do I shine a light? How do I brighten these kids' futures? How do I create a situation where they don't have a dark future? How they know that they can be anything they want? So we started bringing in speakers. We brought people in from all walks of life, people that were like our students that had made a difference in their life, and people who were completely not anything like our students. We wanted them, hopefully through these visitors, to have a light sh that they could see, that they could be whatever they wanted. And it was going great. We had one experience where a student was crying in the hall, and a staff member walked up to her and said, what's wrong? Did you not like the assembly? Did they say something that hurt your feelings? And the young girl looked at the staff member and said, I'm angry. I'm angry because I'm 16, and, and never have I been told that I could be anything until today. It was working. They were seeing that they could become whatever they wanted to be. And I was excited, and I was happy. You'd think that each year it would get easier, and it didn't. 
2017-2018 was an incredibly difficult year for our school. We had seven suicide attempts out of 160 kids. I mean, seven of our students were choosing to self-harm, trying to end their own lives. We had two students who were shot. The first one was shot, spent two weeks in the hospital and came out and he still walks with a limp. The second one died. His name was Irving. I loved Irving. 15-year-old kid, super easy to make smile. You'd tell a joke and Irving was the first to laugh, the first to smile, and now he's dead. Shot by a rival gang member. This became my defining problem. How do I create an environment where these kids know that they're loved? See, there's another study. Along with the ACE study, there's a study that says one loving adult can wipe out the effects of almost all that trauma that that kid has experienced. That means if you take a kid from a home full of trauma and you give them one loving adult, all of those traumas can be wiped away. My mind was blown. This became my defining problem. How do I create an environment that these kids know that they're loved unconditionally? Not loved dependent on how they acted, not loved depending on how they perform, but loved unconditionally. So I spent that summer reading books, thinking of all of the people who I loved, my mentors, and I came across one mentor, a man that I love named Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers had a very, very important number to him, so important that he maintained 143 pounds for most of the end of his life. Mr. Rogers said it, 143 takes one letter to say I, four letters to say love, three letters to say you. I thought when I heard this, when I reread this, I thought, how do I bring this to the school? How do I bring this to my students so that they know that they're loved? And one morning I thought, how about 243? Because it takes two letters to say we, four letters to say love, and three letters to say you. So I grounded up my kids. I have six of them, my own personal kids. That's, I know, that's a lot of kids. So I have six kids. One Saturday, we went to the hardware store. We bought a whole bunch of paint. We bought a bunch of stencils, and I went to the school, and I spray-painted 243 throughout the whole school. You can't stand anywhere in that school and not see that number. The problem was I didn't tell anybody. I told a couple <laughs> staff members. So one day... I get a call, and it's one of our student, t student workers, and he calls, he says, Tyler, we got a problem. I said, what is it, bud? I was thinking a cow had gotten out, or a pig had broken something. He said, somebody broke into the school, and they painted something all over everything. <laughs> he said, they even painted it on, over our owl. We have a very important owl that's our logo, and I spray painted 243 right across the owl's face. He says, they e I'm like, even the owl? He's like, Yep, even the owl. I said, well, what did they paint? He said, they painted 243. I said, oh, no. He's like, what? I said, I think that's gang-related. <laughs> and there's silence on the other end of the line. And I said, just kidding, bud. I did it. I painted 243 out throughout your whole school. And he says, why? What does it mean? I said, I'm not going to tell you right now, but you'll find out when school starts. <laughs> school started, and there was a buzz in the air. All of these kids were saying, what's 243? Why is it everywhere? Teachers had shirts that had 243 on it, and the kids were saying, please tell us what 243 means. Tell us what 243 means. So finally we told them. We said, 243 means we love you. And it changed everything. We went from having seven suicide attempts to zero. We had kids that were having suicidal tendencies, but they knew that there was a loving adult that they could go to, and we got them the help that they needed. We had multiple gang members that left the gang, which is huge. You take a gang member and you pull him and you make him gang free, that's changing his life. That's shining a light way brighter than anything else you can do. 23 years ago, I met Augustine. Augustine. <laughs> Taught me that I can pick my problems. And I've spent the last 10 years teaching these students that they don't have to be defined by the problems that they have in life. They don't have to be defined by poverty. They don't have to be defined by substance abuse. They can pick what they want to be defined by. They can pick their problem and move forward solving that problem. I'm grateful for Augustine, but more than anything, I'm grateful for the connections that love creates. I'm grateful that we can go through this life and we can find people and we can pull them and we can light their way. Thank you.